So, good morning everybody. Thank you for attending this session. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to have the opening talk in this session. Um, to, to start with, I'm not an archaeologist. I am a computer scientist and astronomer. And my interest is historical astronomy and, um, well, doing some computer graphics for astronomical simulation. First, I want to uh, give a short outline. Uh, why are we doing all this? What do we get from observing the sky? Um, and then I'm talking about combining landscape and sky simulation. How can we do that with computer graphic methods? And then I will concentrate on one product, which is Stellarium, an open source astronomy program, with, uh, which I'm at the moment co-developing. When we go out uh, in, uh, under city sky, we see not very much of a, of a night sky anymore. We have basically ruined our night sky. That's a uh, very bad situation, actually, because we, we have lost context. We have lost the contact with the sky. Uh, in order to really understand how a natural sky looks like, we have to go far away. So a, a rural sky, a very dark natural sky, should, should, be, should be dark. You should see the Milky Way, if it's visible, if it's above us. You should see thousands of stars. Um, but it's not really a static thing. Um, if we observe the sky, we get a feeling of diurnal motions of, uh, that, that can give us a, a, an idea of orientation. We see the cardinal directions. When we observe over the, over the weeks and months, we see annual changes on the sky. So the same stars are visible, but not on the same time, not on the same time of the day uh, during the seasons. So we can uh, get a feeling of when, which, which stars are visible when and how they can guide us through the year. And there are, of course, from that uh, we can estimate that there are also spiritual aspects which uh, are not my expertise, so I cannot talk much about that. But just as a feeling, as an as a observer myself, as an amateur astronomer, um, of course we are, we are standing in a landscape and we are surrounded by the sky. So basically this combination of sky and landscape is what I think the, the topic of skyscape is all about. When we see the day sky, it's just blue, various shades of blue, but uh, it's not so spectacular. The spectacle begins at nightfall. And this is what really uh, makes a night sky, thousands of glittering stars. Um, and it's also not a static thing. The sky is moving, so within half an hour, when you're sitting out at the camp campfire, you can see the, star, the, the, the sky rotates and you may begin uh, telling stories and, and, and getting inspiration of, about uh, what this is all about in the outer reach behind the landscape. Now, if we want to engage with the sky uh, as it might have appeared in prehistoric time, we have to do that with computer graphics because the sky has changed over the decades, over the millennia. Uh, the stars are moving due to precession, to uh, wobbles in the Earth's axis. So we can only recreate a prehistoric sky with means of computer graphics. And to do that, we can either combine and, and add astronomical elements into existing uh, architectural visualization systems, um, for instance, uh, if, if, if you're working with SketchUp uh, and you have a, a bit of an archaeological landscape here, a bit of terrain model and maybe some interesting sites, um, the, um, this terrain is limited, so you cannot map the, mount the mountains that are very far away from your site. So you can go out into the field and make a panorama photograph to enclose yourself, to, to see also the mountains behind your, your little terrain. Um, but if you change the site. If you go a few steps away to another site, you have to make another panorama photograph. So that it may be possible if you only have one viewpoint, but um, if you need more than one viewpoint, you have to make so many panorama photographs that this gets also tedious. Uh, so there should be better means for that. Um, a couple of years ago, game engines became quite big. So uh, I don't know who, who is doing virtual archaeology, but the Unity game engine has become quite popular. So with Unity, we can make nice landscape visualizations um, that are practically computer games, but serious games. So uh, we can walk around in what we think a prehistoric landscape may have looked like. There are campfires, there, are, there might be some uh, artificial, artificial characters. Um, and you get a pretty good impression how the landscape might have looked like. And in this case, we also were able to show uh, the, a very um, uh, good 
indication of, a, of an astronomical orientation of one of the entrances of such a Neolithic circular ditch system in Paranatsberg. Uh, this is properly oriented with the summer solstice sunset. In order to do that, you have to program your own sky model in Unity. There is no pre-configured sky model in this program. So, um, of course, that takes time and effort. Uh, and uh, it's, if you're not familiar with programming and developing this yourself, you will have to hire some people and this, becomes, this might become quite expensive. <laughs> so my approach is rather going cheap, going uh, with, with uh, self-made models. Um, and well, Unity is also very fine. So the other way is we can implement, or uh, we, we should try to implement architectural visualization directly in an astronomy program. And a couple of years ago, there has uh, one, one of the astronomy programs have become uh, available that's even open source. That means uh, if you need something, you can just put it in yourself. So as a, as a computer scientist, I'm able to download the source code, uh, view into it, and, and add what's necessary to. Uh, for your own purposes. It's also the, the, the power of open source is the developer is driven by his own interests and so of course things are added that the developers require. Um, now Stellarium has become very popular. It's, it runs on every pl uh, platform um, and it, it delivers a very beautiful sky simulation that's nowadays also um, capable to properly visualize the sky over several thousand years. So, uh, and, and it's also very good for, for um, historical and, and cultural astronomy because we can exchange the constellation patterns. We can depict the stars after they have appeared to uh, Mesoamerican people. So they have totally different constellations, of course. We can add a photo horizon as our landscape panorama. Um, and if you need something, you can write the plugin and, uh, well, add your stuff. So to make sure that the panorama, that the landscape panorama is correct, um, it's not possible to, to have a properly configured panorama photograph um, as, your, as your background, as a landscape background. Um, you can even have a measured polygon line. So if you, have a, if you go out with a total station, theater light or whatever, and you have a measured horizon line, you can put that in into Stellarium to have a properly visible horizon line that you exactly see where uh, a mountain is in the way and where the sun might rise at some point in time. There's other software that also can create artificial uh, landscape horizons. There is a software that's called Horizon by Andrew Smith. Um, and this can export native Stellarium panorama photographs, or panorama horizons, uh, the model from the SRTM data. It's not totally accurate, but uh, it's a very good first start. And now we even did it, we did a uh, we added a plugin to Stellarium that's called Scenery 3D, where you can take whichever model path you have learned or are willing to learn to create a 3D foreground model that you can load into Stellarium as long as you can create a georeferenced OBJ file. So an OBJ file is a standard uh, 3D graphics file. And you can use all kinds of modeling, starting with SketchUp uh, or laser scan models or a photo scan model. That means you make 100 photographs of your site and you make a 3D model out of that. Um, and if, as, as, as soon as you have an OBJ model, if you know where north is, if you can properly georeference it, you can load it into Stellarium and walk around and see all the possible alignments between stones, between the temple axis and whatever you have. To do that, you should have a sort of digital terrain model um, and the map, so you, you know basic features of your landscape. Um, and then whatever you have in data, you, this might have been, I'm, I'm coming from a from an institute that does prospection, uh, so we, we have met magnetograms, we have GPR data, uh, we have uh, all, uh, excavation maps as well, um, <coughs> interpretation maps. You can reconstruct your building models from that. And, well, for a digital terrain model, until a few years ago, we could download or we could get um, a raster image from your local survey authority that had a, had a raster width of maybe 25 or 50 meters. This was fine for the mountains far away in the background, but it was not accurate enough if you're standing on the ground and want to see one rock that's just beside you. You have to model, to model the, the rock yourself. Um, then there was the SRTM uh, mission, the spaceborne uh, radar mission that provided us with a 90 meter raster. It's also fine for the 
outer mountains, but not, not accurate enough for uh, the place we're standing on, or similar models, the, the Aster GDEM, for instance, or a combined combination of that, the EU DEM, it's a 25 meter raster. Um, it's all fine, but there's something better. Um, LiDAR is a game changer. LiDAR, a couple of years ago, has been introduced, airborne laser scanning, and this is now available also typically from your local <coughs> surveying authorities, or you may go out there see the exhibition about the uh, LiDAR drone. Um, it's possible to get a meter class or even better digital elevation model. For instance, this is a, an example done with Frederick Heller, uh, eight by eight kilometers of uh, some terrain in Belgium. Uh, this is what you might have got before, a 10 meter raster. Well, you see some, uh, some things, some straight lines. It could be roads, but maybe. Um, but now, this is what you get with LiDAR. You see practically everything. You see the furrows in the field. Uh, you see every path and way. It, you see even too much, you see the vegetation here, but a good thing is with LiDAR processing you can just filter them away. So you skip the trees, you put away the buildings and you have the landscape. At least today's landscape, of course it's not, not exactly the same as the prehistoric landscape. So there may be landslides and whatever that may have changed the landscape. But this is the, uh, the, the, the best way to get really dependable, very, very accurate landscape at least of today's shape. To build a landscape model, uh, we need such a landscape model. We, we need a terrain model, and uh, we can use today's aerial views as a texture, as a, as a, uh, just as the color of the surface. And then we should decide in GIS which part do we have to model. So we take the view shed of our uh, dig site or of the interesting area, and we can, we can now concentrate on modeling these yellow marks. Uh, because all the rest is not visible from our side anyway. So we just uh, clip away, we just frame our uh, interesting area and export that into what's called a TIN, a triangulated irregular network. Um, it's sort of a mesh that you can then uh, transform into the uh, OBJ base layer. Um, in this case we decided to make two meshes, one coarse and one fine mesh, the fine mesh for the inner area. Uh, and you see uh, this, this shows every detail that the, that the LiDAR image also had shown, you see every path, every furrow, uh, and every little detail. Then you have properly, uh, you, you, you may have made a, an archaeological interpretation, so you can map these lines, you can map, map the uh, excavation results uh, and make, make a, an ordinary texture for your model, and then you can make a very simple model. For instance, we had post holes, um, and you can put posts in there. If you, if you have an idea of uh, how the posts may belong together, you can colorize them and export that uh, as a simple model. Put all this together in Blender, which is another very good open source product, uh, a 3D modeling program. Uh, or you can take, of course, other programs if you know them. And then you can load that into, Sketcher, in, into Stellarium and walk around among the posts and see whether there are, are any astronomical alignments. Um, so, for instance, here is a, uh, something that's very close to the meridian line here, and there may be other things like uh, solstice alignments and other orientation points. Um, so you can really explore that under the prehistoric sky in Stellarium in an open source product, and this all comes for free. And you don't even have to, you, you don't need a supercomputer. I did this, this movie on my notebook. You can do shadow analysis if you have a rock that may have cast interesting shadows. Uh, or there's a sundial here, you just make a structure for motion model and load it into Stellarium and you can explore the, the course of time and the course of the shadows here. Uh, you might know this one, that's a very uh, famous site, uh, Chichen Itza, the pyramid with this snake uh, shadow. Um, well, wherever, wherever you are, there are certainly interesting sites for you. You can explore and uh, uh, experience what this guy might have looked like thousands of years ago. Um, when you do a, such a model, I really implore you, please verify your topography. When I first read about Samit Zegitusa, uh, I have read that this is oriented with the main axis pointing towards winter solstice sunrise. Well, it's fine on a map, but uh, the authors didn't take the mountains into account. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, this just doesn't work. Uh, it's very important. Uh, if you can, of course, make a site visit. Uh, I had a bit of bad luck, I had bad weather, so uh, it was all foggy, and uh, as you can see, there's also a forest in the way, so I, can't, I couldn't really uh, verify the, the exact layout of the mountains, but the mountains are important. Um, and 
if you do everything correct, this is some work I did previously this year uh, with Bernhard Frischer, we could show that, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the main axis of the entrance of what is called the Antinoeon in the Hadrian's Villa is properly oriented with the summer solstice sunrise behind the mountains that are east of the Tivoli. So this, that's uh, really a very, a very accurate, nice match, a very nice result of this new plugin. Five minutes, okay, wonderful. Um, so, uh, the last part is about outreach with Stellarium. Um, we have made this year an exhibition about Stonehenge. Uh, they said it's the first exhibition about Stonehenge out, out of the UK, uh, which I could hardly believe, but well, maybe that, that's the case. We have a Museum of, Prehist of Prehistory in Austria, that's the Mammuts. Um, it's in, in two sites, one is a permanent museum and the other one is, is a site that has been opened a couple of years ago for uh, um, ex annual exhibitions. So uh, this year and also it, it will <coughs> run next year is about Stonehenge. It was created by my director of Neubauer and Julian Richards. And uh, <coughs> the exhibition hall is quite large and it, it was possible to recreate the in a horseshoe of, of Stonehenge, the, the, the stones of the horseshoe, uh, in one-to-one -one scale, so in, in natural size. And it's really impressive when they're standing in the hall and you're standing in front of that. Wow, it really looks very impressive, as you can see in the photograph here. And we have some other, we, we have a tour from the Mesolithic down uh, up, up to the Bronze Age. Um, and one of the things is in the upper floor, we have a panorama wall, 25 meters wide and four meters high, where you're standing in the middle of the horseshoe and you look out of Stonehenge into the landscape and we can display the development of, of Stonehenge. We can display the various, various building phases, but we also take the people to other sites. Uh, so not only Stonehenge, but uh, the surrounding. Um, if, we, if we want, we could also show the night sky. Um, so this is how the upper hall looks like. Um, you see you're surrounded on, on, on the right side, you see uh, well, one of the trilithons with the lintel slightly raised so that you see the, the joints. And uh, well, on the screen, we are displaying what we think uh, the, the, uh, how Stonehenge evolved, or other sites like Woodhenge here. Um, and you can also, because this is an astronomical simulation program, it's not a static movie, it's not a dead movie, as I, as I call it. Uh, you can show the difference between sunrise as it, as it used to be in uh, the late Neolithic or as it would appear today because the axis of the Earth has shifted a bit. And the best thing is, of course, nightly tours for children. Uh, they, they go through the museum, it's dark, they go through the museum with fla flashlights and have a, uh, a guided tour. And there's even an impersonator uh, who plays the man from the Bronze Age. Uh, and explains with <coughs> mimics and, and, and acting how people might, uh, might have used the tools that are on, on display there. Uh, and we have, we have uh, put, put Stellarium into, into uh, early morning twilight mode. Um, and well, after the tour, twilight starts to become a bit brighter and we can uh, wait for the summer solstice sunrise here. And this gives a very nice atmosphere. It's very immersive. It's a huge screen, 25 meters wide. You, you get really your, your eyes full of the atmosphere. So this is what I call the skyscape planetarium. And the tour ends with, uh, uh, well, with the sunrise and a, a little ceremony with that, some dancing. And uh, well, it's, it's the, the, the peak of this tour and well, this also concludes my talk and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>